I mean, you know, congratulations for the start on, on this kind of sustained kind of work that over such a long period of time, this kind of dry humour that, uh, you know, is there all the time and it's well orchestrated. Where, where does it come from? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, know. I think... Uh, I guess originally, you know, I just wanted to be you know, one of the class clowns type of kids. So I wanted to, you know, make make a funny film, and uh, maybe the impulse never stopped. Oh. Yeah, well, the class clown is always in a group, isn't it? Isn't he? And the, uh, oh yeah, well, uh, yeah, you could pick your audience, and uh, most of the audience were in the film, so it sort of has that right. feel too. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, that's one of the things I've picked up too, the, this feeling that you're kind of working with a group and there's a kind of an intimacy of gesture that you kind of get into the films. How, you know, I mean, I'm sure that every film has its own strategies in sort of putting it together, but how much sort of planning and what's the process of getting, uh, you know, some of those early pieces up? Um, I, I think the first few films I've tried to make were actually quite kind of earnest and none, none of them are there. And... Uh, it just seemed to me that the less ambitious the films were, the, you know, the better, the more fun they were. So uh, uh, all the early Super 8s were made. Uh, I think it was this kind of you know, seasonal cycle where I'd kind of have an idea and get it in shape for the Super 8 Festival, which was like an annual event. And that usually meant uh, pinning my friends down for a day or a weekend that they you know, had to uh, right. contribute to. Yeah. Uh, but you, you, you give them something to start the ball rolling. Um, I guess I mean everything was scripted, and then uh, somehow they had agreed to do it. Hey, Paloma. What do you want? I thought we could hold a conversation. I'm reading some junk mail. Maybe later. Maybe later. living in those kind of spaces that they were in the films and you, you come up with those ideas you know, <coughs> or, you know as part of daily life or how did that work uh, yeah the flats in every single one of those films even the ambitious one at the end right. was uh, it uh, and uh, I must have been making these films and I'm, uh, uh, certainly, the, the the final film you know, suggests that there was this you know, final aspiration to, this to make kind of narrative bigger films. To the whole thing, yeah. 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 So, but based on the earlier idea of just you know, the domestic space. And yeah. yeah. I suppose we could. I mean, we could talk about that last film then, because uh, Bill gave it some kind of prominence in his introduction. I mean, so that that was the kind of only really funded film that that was shown in that whole program, wasn't it? Uh, I think that's true. The, um, th that was originally conceived, it was going to be uh, a third of a, a portmanteau yeah. film. Mm. So uh, Bill was uh, had, had a half an hour script and Marie Craven, whose films showed it as an artist film yeah. workshop, uh, had half an hour. Uh, and I think at that stage we had some funding for script development. Um, or I, I guess maybe we did because Adrian Martin was like script editor. Yeah, Adrian. We were working yeah, on the project all for three. a while, and and it almost went yeah. into production um, funding. Um, we were asking about a million for it, which in those days was just like a low budget feature. Mm. I'm going to ask, 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 ask for half of that. I'm, I'm thinking maybe. Yeah, maybe. maybe. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. S Sarah, who may have been Johnson or Zada at that stage, was producing the the. Uh, the project, and I think we thought we had a fair go. The, the project was called The Everyday, and that, that was mm. sort of going to be the, the mm. thing that loosely tied it together. And there were a few kind of these, uh, you know, curious little 16mm feature things that were getting a run every now and then. We thought we might just uh, jump onto that one. Yeah. Um, but th that was the only one that actually uh, got made. I love watching you iron. I love ironing. Well, it's interesting you uh, mentioned Mahari too. I mean, it sounds like that 
there's a sensibility in that kind of film that it's almost like at last we were going to get in the, into the mainstream some kind of European kind of sensibility which is more about style and and that kind of thing rather than you know the, the fantastic stories uh, I mean that does it I can see how those skills could kind of move more into a international kind of space but they they didn't did they? a lot of that Melbourne stuff didn't kind of uh, end up doing that no I, I guess all the work is one of its own little niche and now it's just getting on you know, another little f flicker and some of it's entombed on YouTube and stuff like that so you know, it's there and it's, it's yeah. nice to revive it I think. I, mean, what, what, I, I was thinking too though about I mean the, you know that work but then you think about someone like the American like George Cusio who kind of I think a bit about your films when I see that he, he kind of did these kind of suburban kind of angst kind of situation everyday kind of things and you know your work has a, a similar sort of sustained quality but perhaps because uh, you know Melbourne doesn't kind of reach the same kind of international audience and and so that didn't happen um, I, I, I think that film only sh showed in a couple of places and I think yeah. Adrian mentioned George Kucha who I don't know oh. so Adrian also mentioned a few other people I no I'm thinking more about yeah. a lot of that earlier Super 8 stuff yeah, you know yeah, yeah. Uh, what about uh, Swinburne and Rusden? Did oh, they yeah, yeah. end up having an influence on you at all? Well, uh, like the first film was made at Rusden, and then I made uh, another sort of more earnest film, which I quite like, uh, called A Nocturne, which was, um, oh, yeah, there, there's an obvious autobiographical element in that, you know, most of the last films uh, feature my wife or girlfriend in them. and. The early films were really just me wandering around the suburbs by myself or, or an alter ego. So the, the, the Nocturne one was about a right. bloke wandering around the suburbs at night looking at you know trees under sodium lamps. Um, but I think that, that was well enough made to get into Swinburne. I think I was going to make a more earnest film and then for oh. some reason I changed my mind and made the Beards of Evil film. I think right. I was sort of like, no, I, I, I can't manage that. Leave underneath it all even though it's all kind of much more about this everyday thing and this kind of sort of intimacy and the, all these gestures this also seems to be a, a, a sort of a political thing underneath them all you know like I mean clearly in the in the uh, the Queen's birthday and the one about the ads the, the Foxhound laundromat there's kind of a bit of this sort of more clear but underneath it all a sort of a, a bit of you know statements about what it's like to live in this time yeah, the, uh, the Bell Hanra, Matt Monch, I haven't seen for a while. I mean, I enjoyed it because it was, uh, you know, just uh, abuse directed at corporations. So I suppose that was, yeah, oh, I mean, it still is, uh, you know, irresistible. <laughs> Gosh, that's a shit house ad, Robin. Yes, but, but I've done the Westpac ad. Yes, but I'm the one who's done the Westpac ad. Uh, Swinburne and Rosden, well, you know, then, then there's also, of course, this, uh, the Super 8 group itself. Oh, well, that, yeah, that seems to be very important. Well, I, I reckon I actually learned more at the Super 8 group. Like, Rosden was like a just place that needs some equipment, do what you like, and then Swinburne had, it felt like it was a bit more structured, but I think since that I was there in 84, I think it's become much more structured and there's more like a proper pedagogy. Then it was really, you know, there were personalities like Peter Tammer. Right who you could admire as filmmakers, but you're still sort of 
working by on your own to a certain extent at that period. And I think that yeah. The, the, the so you think Peter had an influence on your work? Uh, no. Uh, um, <laughs> as, a, as a teacher, did you know directly as a teacher? Yes, yeah. Um, I, uh, I found that I admired him immensely as a filmmaker, and that was really a strong thing. Was I think it was there were people I admired, but they weren't you know, really conspicuous filmmakers. Um, on the other thing you, you'd notice about Beards of Evil was that John Flouse is in it. Yeah. So it's a real Swinburne film. Yeah, okay. if, if you see a Swinburne film and he's not in it, it's probably a fake. Wesley, haven't you left yet? No, Mr. Head Gardener, sir. Bit of a mix up, you know, tickets and money. I'll have to come back here and work a little longer. Oh, I'm sorry, Wes. Your job's been given to someone else. The Super Act group was actually somehow was meeting people. It, it seemed to point more systematically towards both the canon of sort of the Cinematech films, so which seemed more rigorous, and also the um, just the you know this miasma of all the experimental filmmaking that was happening. So. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, I thought when you mentioned Peter, I mean, I've seen Long yeah. Jay's Journey into Night yeah. recently, and how he has these kind of twists and move into other spaces you now from his films, and I kind of felt that happening in, in a couple of your films too. That you start somewhere, you end up completely different, different surprisingly in the film, but it doesn't, you know, by the time the film finishes, it all makes sense in its own kind of unique way. I do like the little arbitrary things yeah. just happening. Just, um, it's gonna, something will be happening there, something will be happening there. I don't know whether it's going to tie together or whether it's no. just... Uh, no, well, I don't feel that. Uh, yeah, well, so okay. is, that, is that happening to you when you're making it? Um, some of the really loose ones were just, you know, footage was found and then I just tried to, you know, s somehow piece it together so that it seemed vaguely coherent. <laughs> What about the, all the, the, the text, you know? I mean, you're really kind of, that's a whole thread that uh, runs through everything, and that keeps on changing in the way you put it together, but there was a, there was a, a continuing kind of, uh, you know, theme through a lot of the films, how you kind of use text. Yeah, yeah, of, yeah I, I did really just love handwriting, ha handwritten signs, uh, yeah. full stop, and yeah, originally, because the first couple of films I thought I could make with the films uh, with my friends that, you know, didn't involve any particular acting skills. I thought that, you know, the solution to the problem is you shoot a silent film and you just put up the captions mm. and you don't really need acting. And uh, I think just <coughs> that enjoying the captions made me like, like handwriting stuff, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, that, that's another, another something we can move into is the, is the sound as well. I mean, the kind of your use of sound that reminded me a bit of the George Cush show too, because you use this melodramatic sound, kind of to think about silent film and stuff. But that, that's pr you've you've made some really sort of decisive choices, and subtle choices about the sound in a lot of those films, and you know, and the timing of that is kind of really kind of adds to the kind of the com whole comedic kind of element to it. Yeah, the um. Well, well, the last film, I guess, because it's, you know, it's got a very deliberate pace to it. It's got yeah. you know, sound effects where you, you know, just, I guess, the basic language of film, you can introduce your sound early or yeah. do different things to it. Uh, that was also very heavily dependent on the, not just the acting and the cinematography, but the music. And I, I, I noticed Robin Cassinard happens to be lurking in the back tonight. Which, uh, so Robin did the you know, really great score in that last film and, and a couple of films which we didn't show tonight. <laughs>
remember when we showed the miracles of Hilda, which was like shown at Super 8 Film Festival stuff, uh, and that was a proper Super 8 film, it's a cut on film, and it had a cassette running with it. And in the day, you know, you'd be in the projector booth, and sometimes you'd have to stop the projector for two seconds just to get it roughly right, or maybe stop the cassette. And uh, oh, I missed that. That was good. <laughs> you missed doing that, yeah. I mean, so, so you feel there's a bit of a performative element too, because you're kind of showing these films to a group of people who kind of, uh, you know, uh, who sort of uh, appreciate your, who you are, or it's kind of like a relationship's developed in the group, and, not, and you and you, you try these things out with this group of people. Is that part of what's going on? I guess the open screenings we used to run had, had that effect and the, most of those films were shown at Christmas parties too and I'd, I'd show a film and the people were in it, Bill came along some of the shows and film of yes. Bill's as well. So the, there was that sort of performance sort of thing too. Shouldn't really open it up to anybody else who wants to ask some questions. I've sort of held the floor for a while in terms of that. Has anyone else got any questions that want to ask, Chris? I missed the start, so I wasn't sure if you asked what drew you to filmmaking in the first place. Uh, yeah, I think uh, well, really the most primitive level was an opportunity to show off. I think that was uh, that would be where it tick, you know, took off. Uh, and probably the Queen's Birthday film, it was, I mean, it, probably when I was a teenager, I would have seen, you know, Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton mm. and thought, oh, you know, the funny people making films and it's about them. Um, and then, you know, made a silent film that, which actually was originally silent, the, the uh, soundtrack was an afterthought. <laughs> It's kind of a, a bit of a surprise that that work didn't travel further, you know, in terms of, because it's, it's very accessible. I guess there's just, you know, there's so many good good films, it's the, you know, why have screenings like this and more, far more recent films that, you know, struggling to get seen. That's yeah, well, I mean, I, I've been thinking about this yeah. uh, in terms of Melbourne, you know, and the Melbourne sort of culture and kind of a, a lot of important kind of work that has kind of happened here in parallel to what's happening in other places. And a lot of the Melvin kind of work just hasn't sort of gone out there, got out there mm. in that same sort of way where stuff that's similar from other places, especially America or England, is kind of well known, you know? Mm. And I think that's kind of an issue that can be addressed and I think it needs to be addressed and there are people, you know, bodies of work like your own that, are, that offer a real strong sort of argument that, you know, there, there's, some unhid, there's some hidden gems in this kind of invisible history in, Austra in, in Melbourne in particular. I mean, people write histories about Australian experimental or narrative films but sort of Melbourne it seems to be a bit off to the side. It doesn't. It hasn't been documented in the same way. Even though there's the Cantrell's film, those and the Super Eight group, but in, in a kind of a more kind of recent way of looking at this work. I mean, now I'm kind of I'm sort of talking about myself in a way. But having been to other places like Serbia and stuff and seeing the work there, and then starting to see that there's been things done in those places that weren't done somewhere else. You know, I, I think we need to look at ourselves a bit more like that as well. Grew, 
grew up watching a sort of a canon of international innovative filmmaking, mm. which has excluded a lot of, of Mel certainly Melbourne work. It, it's really hard. Australia really is like this, you know, big island that's away from the rest of the world. And the rest of the world sees it as this, you know, par paradisial kind of place, that it's a great place to live and doesn't consider it culturally. And, and that, that's a battle that, you know, has to be fought continuously. I think so, but I think aren't we also at a point now where that, that game can be played a bit differently by us? Sure. You know? Yeah. And, and Chris actually has... Um, I, I think all of these films are online on, on YouTube, so he's made an effort in digitising uh, the work. For me, a lot of it is, you know, filmmakers taking responsibility and trying to at least, you know, digitise the film work, the Super 8 16 mil work they had in the 70s, 80s, uh, <coughs> even into the 90s, and, and just making it available. So it's... And of course, a, a great thing that Bill's done is, you know, it's stuck that growing collection of, I don't know if it's 50 or 60 films from each decade yeah. um, on the independent website through the pure shit thing, which is it's an incredible resource. And, mm. and it's almost overwhelming because I, I don't know yeah. how many There has to be, yeah, there's a lot of information there. there, isn't there? Yeah. I think, oh, Nigel, watch them all. Yeah, I'll watch them all. Is it's it great. 20 or 40 hours? Yeah, yeah, it was a long time. I just watched it instead of watching TV. And <laughs> watch that. In um, the evening, it took a while, but I got through it and um, I wouldn't have seen them otherwise and I really yeah. enjoyed it. Right. I'd like to talk about the Super 8 group a bit because we've got um, Stephen Ball in the audience oh, yeah. who um, is actually here so from there. London. There he is. <laughs> so we um, haven't asked a question yet, Stephen. So basically, Stephen came to Australia in 1988. I don't have any questions. I'll give you anyway, a couple of questions. <laughs> so the Super 8 group started in late 1985, and I'm, I'm really, I mean, you've kind of answered it a little bit already, Chris, but like you were making 16 mil films and you were at the professional film school, and yet Super 8 obviously attracted you, you know, with its freedom and, and you could kind of be a bit looser, I guess, and do something really kind of quirky. Um, so, Stephen, when you came from London in 1988, and found the Super 8 group, what, mm -hmm. what were your initial impressions? Um, I think, well, I think my very first impression was uh, I couldn't imagine this happening in London, which is where I'd come from. Mm. So I was kind of, at that point, I was fairly familiar with, um, I mean, I'd done a little bit of work based at the London Filmmakers Co-op, which was, uh, you know, which at that time, late 80s, although it had kind of, passed through it, its period that you would think of as a kind of very much a kind of ex, ex, ex structural experimental kind of uh, scene. I mean, it was dominated by a, a handful of, of filmmakers um, and then had sort of become much more, um, well, much, much looser in terms of the kind of politics of, of film itself and and you know through the kind of so-called new romantic period of people like Jarman and John mm. Mabry and so on so it had gone through a lot of things but it was still very much considered to be um, what we might now call artist film um, practice um, and when I first came to the I, I went to I think the first screening I went to would have been still when you were still doing the screenings at RMIT, at RMIT. in that little mm -hmm. in that little room, mm -hmm. um, and I saw God, I can't remember who was there. I think David Cox was there, Nick Ostrovskis was there. You were there, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. And what I saw were a number of um, I don't know, possibly Ian Poppins or somebody like that. So what <laughs> what I saw were a number of people making very very different types of films mm -hmm. from uh, mm -hmm. from films that were very you know quite obviously kind of fairly serious uh, narrative fiction films to people who are making films that were kind of documentary to to, to somebody like Nick Ostrovskis who was making films that was very kind of formalist mm. and abstract um, and my first impression was I'd, I can't imagine how all of these people can be in the same room <laughs> making so yeah, many yeah, kind of different types of films without actually kind of having fights afterwards yeah. or something you know well, they, it was they, that they sort they of did eventually but of course the you know the the, the point was that, that, that they were all Super 8 films, so it was the fact that the, mm. um, that, that the 
the gauge of film was was what everybody had in common and that was really what what the significance of the group was about i mean that's kind of obvious in in the name of the group mm. but i think it's sort of also i mean something that i was thinking about when dirk was talking to chris about his his work and in the context of super 8 what you know, one of one of the one of the observations about Chris's films is is that he's throughout he's kind of in in different ways in some cases, but throughout he's he's always using stuff that's at hand. You know, stuff that's sort of within his everyday life that he can use mm -hmm. to adapt. So there's this very kind of DIY sort of quality to to the work in that sense. Whether it's you know whether it's actually about uh, materials that are used to construct kind of props and stuff or whether it's it's the sort of the, the, the sort of DIY quality of the music and that kind of thing or whether it's sort of basing characters on you know y yourself and your, your your everyday life and 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 setting it in in your flat it's it's very much kind of still part of a sort of domestic activity that um, and, and I think that's that's common with with most super 8 films and, and particularly the kind of work that was be that, that came out of the or 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 was either came out of or was attracted to the the Super 8 group around you know around those years from the 80s through to the kind of my involvement was mostly during the the first five or six years of the 90s. But um, what what is in common about Super 8 film practice is is that it is a kind of domestic practice. It's a it's a you know it's a domestic medium. It was it was produced. It was sold as as, as such. And and I think that one of the things that we all felt about the work that we were doing was that it was also kind of self determining. There was there was a sort of determination within. It it wasn't we we didn't have ambitions to be something bigger or greater. Mm -hmm. We 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 thought that there was something important and serious about what we were doing as a, a, a practice, even though all of our practices were, were quite different. You know, there were people like you, Bill, and, and, and Richard mm -hmm. Tui at the time was making, uh, you know, Super 8 films, uh, narrative films that would be influenced by Goddard and Bresson and Ozu and those kind of people. So this is, you know, this is a serious kind of film practice. It's not, it's not the kind of cliche of the kind of the calling card to to, to, to kind of so-called greater things and commercial success. It, it, I think we were very aware of the fact that we were kind of producing our own scene in and of itself and by ourselves. So those questions about um, whether and how the work travels beyond and outside of Melbourne, in, in, in some senses never really occurred to me very much because I, I kind of think we, we sort of made our own scene and, and 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 mm. that was very much in the moment and of the time it was it was being made and that was kind of the important thing at the time i mean uh, sort of pos mm. you know well, recognition of it it now historically might be another thing but yeah, that's, I think mm. that, that's right. in and of itself it had its value it's quite but interesting that when you compare that to you know, put it next to other places where there was also those kind of things happening, that there is a kind of difference there, you know, and there's a kind of, uh, you know, I've, I've got looking for uh, there's this sort of suburban kind of uh, pseudo-naive approach. I mean, I even see it in, in Bill's film, when Bill made that film about the, the revolution, I'd see these people walking through these spaces in Greece, but they were walking through those spaces, or Bill was all correct in the way he'd learned to get move people in suburban Melbourne. I mean, I kind of yeah. start, yeah. you know, yeah. th th there's those things are there, you know? Yeah. 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 Back, back to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, um, just talking about your movies, to your films, Chris, yes. that because they are so idiosyncratic, but they also have, um, a, a really strong, clear structure that mm. take you through it, and you, at, at any point in the film, you sort of know how far through you are. And I'm just wondering how conscious you are when you're making it, when you're putting them together, of of uh, putting the structure in that lets people have a sense of where they are in the in the story. I guess the ones that were scripted, you know, you script it and you have a sense that the script works, but I, I don't think I analyse it very well, which is why it was nice working with Adrian Martin, who's a script editor, and we'd find little threads that I should, uh, you know, work on or p perhaps get rid of. Um, 
then in the editing process, you're just trying to make it work. But I've, I've always been kind of unconfident with the editing, which is why I've confessed that at least three of those films had scenes deleted after they were finished. So, because um, I just thought it, it maintained their interest. Uh, and with the last film, I remember when it was finally cut, because the, you know, the exigencies of filming it meant some things didn't seem quite like I'd intend them to. Um, and we'd run out of money, so I was going to work with an editor. I was really excited to work with an editor. And as a few of you would know, if you've got whatever amount of money, it's very easy to spend it all on the production. And then uh, there's nothing for post-production. And uh, Ken Sallows, who's a you know, real top editor, agreed to have a look at it. And he said, he's said, he said it's OK. That, that film's all right. Um, but... Um, I always like, the few times I've seen it projected off 16mm, I thought it's great because the cinematography is you know, really nice and I thought that you know, it just helps sustain it and, and, and similarly with the music. So it was uh, nice to see it in a sympathetic, um, you know, with a sympathetic audience. I was thinking, gee, once it's gone a bit low res, does it still hold up? And mercifully it did. So, uh, but uh, yeah, in terms of the structure and knowing that you're keeping people's interest, I, I don't know. It's, it the seemed to, but I'm, 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 I haven't got a phone. Yeah, worry. Your uh, most important film, I presume you haven't mentioned it, I don't know if it still exists, The Eggman. Oh, yes, that's. Which you made when you were about 14, when I went to high school. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I assume that's the film that inspired you to keep going with the camera because we had. You had such fun doing it, and we had Mr. Foldner who was in with it. Oh, yeah, Mr. Foldner played the real estate <laughs> agent. <laughs> Yeah, and he did inspire us, actually. And the other thing about Barry Feldner was uh, he was a teacher who was into film stuff, so I think he must have indoctrinated me. He also had a whole box of old Kodachrome film, uh, which the new shoes were shot on. So that was shot in 1990 on film that was due to expire in 1977. <laughs> but uh, Barry, I don't know what I swapped with him, but uh, yeah. But the, uh, the Eggman, yeah, that's, uh, it's a lost work it would have been it would it was, would be the classic you know th 13 year old boys film uh, myself and the Beatles aspect because because the the plastic uh, Beatles wig I had one when I was six <laughs> and then when we made the egg man we got plastic footballs I don't know if you make them now though and we painted them skin colored and appeared to have egg shaped heads and that was about all that happened <laughs> couple of composers, or we've got Robin here. Oh, so, yeah, so Robin said did, uh, that Beatles score and two others that were made in Darwin, but which sort of, yeah. you know, a bit jazz pop uh, idiom. Uh, and Robin, Robin's been, I haven't seen Robin for 10 years, and he was playing around town, and it's great seeing that music. Um, Ian, who lives in London, did the Beads of Evil score and a couple of other little incidental bits, and most of the other stuff, as uh, you notice, was just, you know, do what you do DIY music. Uh, and the little toy drum kit certainly got a yeah, thorough yeah. working. Yeah, yeah. Did you do the music after you shot the film? Uh, yes. Yeah. Always? Okay. Yes, yes, I think so. I think so. Yeah. The, the kind of cut of heads. Oh, of course. Yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, the drum <coughs> Mm. Yeah. What about the classical type pieces, Chris? Would you put those together yourself or just lift them off uh, the record? Oh, the, the, uh, a lot of stuff was, yeah, just stolen from a record. So there's Mess I Am in Foxical. Uh, Miracle of Field, I just had a lot of, uh, I think it's Handel, maybe, in it. Mm -hmm. uh, the Queen's Birthday was some Elizabeth and music. So from what I, I just thought the music was very strong and, and actually yeah. propelled the, the stories very well. And, uh, yeah, it can, it ma it used across mm. it can make up for a lot of deficiencies, I think. You know, it really yeah, does. I, I yeah. wouldn't call it deficiencies. It just, I think yeah. it just sort of opens that D-Y thing. And, and it, it's just a different aesthetic that... I mean, people wouldn't be able to do that now. You might have done it as a mistake or deficiency. People couldn't reproduce that now because, the, you know, the technology changed so much. I, yeah, I don't know. I've got to say more films. I reckon maybe they could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it doesn't look right yeah. when you use a, a Super 8 kind of flare on an on a iPhone. No. You know. Sure. Uh, we should wrap it up. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much.